to this episode of EGL Life, which accompanies issue 31 of the European Journal of International Law. EGL Life is a fireside chat in which the editors of the journals shine light on one of the articles appearing in the latest issue. We can all read the article, but this conversation allows us to get to know the author, discuss key arguments and satisfy our curiosity by exploring how articles come about. What drives an author? How do they write? What are the challenges they are facing and how do they overcome them? I said EGL Life is a fireside chat, but while I'm close to the fireplace in my home near Cambridge, England, my guest is in Geneva. But lockdown or no lockdown, for the fortunate of us, life continues, EGL continues, and therefore EGL Life continues. With me today is Eske Yildiz, postdoctoral researcher at the Graduate Institute in Geneva and author of the EGL article, A Court with Many Faces, Judicial Characters and Modes of Norm Development in the European Court of Human Rights. Welcome, Eski. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Eski, before we turn to the many faces and characters of the European Court, show us a bit of your many faces and your character. What has your academic journey been? In which direction are you traveling? It's a really good question. Sometimes I also wonder where I have come from. So I was born and raised in Turkey. I finished my BA degree in American culture and literature at Bilkent University in Ankara. So while I was doing this degree, I was already interested in politics. So I started to take uh, courses from political science and international relations that really helped me position myself and also enter a really good master's degree in political science at the graduate Institute. So in 2009, I came to Geneva to do this degree. And this is how my Geneva chapter begins. And um, I really liked it here. So I stayed for the PhD as well, the same department. But maybe I think it was my second year into the PhD program, the Graduate Institute introduced this minor program. So the deal was really straightforward. So you would take a few courses from another department and then find a co-supervisor who is willing to, willing to supervise you. And then you would write a dissertation that would speak to both audiences. So as you can imagine, I picked international law and I started to work with Andrea Bianchi. And I learned a lot from him, especially when it comes to treaty interpretation, legal theories, and judicial behavior. So this article is based on that PhD research that I did uh, for the dissertation and all. And um, But that's just one part of that chapter. So after the PhD, I uh, got a grant from Swiss National Science Foundation to do a postdoc project at Harvard University, where I worked with Catherine Sicking. And uh, maybe like again, six months into my fellowship, I saw this call for applications for a postdoc project. And uh, the call was issued by Nico Krish, who is based at the Graduate Institute. I never uh, actually met Nico Krish. I had, didn't know him personally at that moment. But uh, when I read the call, I saw the appeal because um, I've been working on legal change for a while. And there he was. He wanted to look at broader trends around legal change uh, across different fields of international law. And what was also really fascinating to me, at least, was that um, that he wanted to look at legal change uh, generated through means other than treaty making. So he wanted to look at the practice of courts, institutions, state practice and private authorities. So it was a bit familiar challenging, but overall very interesting. So I applied for this position and I uh, I got in, so I got the job. And uh, that meant that I had to cut my stay at Harvard shorter and come back to Geneva. Okay, so th this is really what you're currently doing and what you're yes. working on. But you you described very interestingly how you, you, you came from international relations and then started working in international law. How was it? How were your conversations with Professor Bianchi? Did you speak the same language? Um, so I don't think initially, so I was very curious. So I started taking his courses and I really liked his teaching style. And uh, and I started reading a lot on these things because I didn't have an entry point before that. I only took some human rights courses with Andrew Clapham. So I knew that field, but I didn't know a lot about the technical details of, details of international law. So I don't, think I was speaking the same language, but I was picking it up fast uh, because of that entry point, because of that, you know, official classroom setting where you learn from the teacher, but also your colleagues as well. And uh, I was up to speed in quite relatively quite short term. Yeah. 
But what about the concepts that um, we share in the sense of international relations talks about norms? International lawyers can talk about norms, but they do not necessarily mean the same thing. Absolutely. And when you were writing your thesis and you have two supervisors in different disciplines, how did that work out? Um, a little difficult. I completely agree because I realized when I started First, I started reading the norms literature in international relations, yeah. and it's really broad. It's about everything and nothing. It's about customs, habits, traditions, fashions. And uh, what I could see in legal literature is that it's really specific. It's about rights and obligations, you know, completely delineated, and they're oftentimes produced through uh, special settings. And, you know, so it was a subset of the norms literature, what IR people actually look at. So I could immediately see the difference. But what drew my interest was the actually the legal norms. That's why I, I said, you know, my analysis will be on the legal norms because I'm more interested in the rights and obligations dynamic and how obligations over time change. So in a way, I situated myself right in the middle and kind of distanced myself from the way IR scholars generally look at law uh, or norms. And I kind of came closer to lawyers, but that's why this article is also like looking at this quite dogmatically because of that positioning. And that's why it's published in the European Journal of International I Law. So huh? too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but do you feel that international relations scholars still, do they still understand you? Or do you need to translate back for them what you're tr doing? Is there an issue in this or not? Am I just... No, it's right on point question because sometimes I wonder the same. I feel like some of them do, especially those who are also familiar with international law. They know where, where I'm coming from, the literature I'm speaking to. They probably read the same things as well. So in a way, mm -hmm. we can speak. But broader group of IR scholars, I am not entirely sure because I definitely especially like depends on the project, right? Like this is um, not going to be like my life view forever, but for this project, uh, dissertation and PhD and what's coming right after, I took more, um, you know, I side, took the side of the lawyers and, you know, explained these things in a more dogmatic way. So they might not necessarily understand. They might find this a little limiting to them. Okay. Well, let's, the readers or the list readers, the, the, the listeners, the watchers, they may not be really interested to know what is this article about? What, what is this dogmatic article? Um, <laughs> and I think for lawyers, it's not at all dogmatic, but okay, Probably. from the IR perspective, it's, it's very dogmatic. Can you tell us a bit, just in a few sentences, um, well, perhaps w what triggered writing this article? And then we can get to what, what is actually in it. But first, the route to the article. It's always so interesting to know why people are writing what they're writing. You can spend several years researching a topic and writing an article. Um, Absolutely. So it's, it's almost a life choice to decide to work on a topic because you're with it for a few years. Absolutely. So for me, the entry point was actually not the European Court. It was the prohibition of torture. I was very much interested in this prohibition. You know, growing up in Turkey and hearing all the stories about uh, different uh, episodes of state violence from coup d'etats to mm -hmm. counterterrorism mm -hmm. measures, I um, I could you know see this happening unraveling in front of me, and I was like, you know, how come a state does that, and what is there to stop this. So the prohibition of torture was like, I felt kind of emotionally connected to that subject. And I initially I wanted to study it sociologically, but that's a difficult thing to do. Access to materials is difficult and dealing with that, such a heavy topic is difficult. So I turned to court judgments because they could provide you with a lot of information about what individuals are going through, but also broader trends. And I chose to do that through the European court because again, it was a familiar setting for me. I, I knew about the court, at least I thought I knew, but the more I started studying the court, I got fascinated by this court and courts in general as well. So in a way, this article brings together these two parallel interests of mine. Yeah. Now, now let's more about what's in the article. So what, what do you try to find out and what is your argument? So I think the message is multi-layered, right? Like on the first level, it's about finding patterns and inconsistencies. Second is about understanding how judgments shape norms dogmatically. And third is also understanding how the European court, this is the empirical side, how the European court shaped the norm against torture. So on the first point, when we see um, courts issuing judgments that are not perfectly aligned, we assume that the court is being a little inconsistent here. And I always wonder, like, what do you mean by this? And why do we expect the court to be inconsistent in the first place? Because when you look at the body like the European court, it's perfectly normal that it's being a little inconsistent because it assumes completely different tasks, functions, and it's responding to different needs. So my attempt here was just to 
figure out, you know, what's the pattern behind this? And this is how I came up with the idea of judicial characters. I thought the court has multiple audiences responding to multiple needs. That's why, that's why it has multiple hats. And these are the judicial characters that kind of uh, have kind of shine light on different characters of the court. You know, you have the entrepreneur, you have the arbitrator and delineator. Uh, entrepreneur one is the one clarifying. Arbitrator one is the one uh, judiciously applying. And delineator one is the one that's um, evasive and showing the limits of the norms application. And in a way, my the, I think the novelty of this argument is that I assume that these characters are all available to the court and court doesn't have to pick and choose between them. It can hold them at the same time and switch between them as well. So this is kind of the idea about the finding patterns and in inconsistencies. And the second is about how judgments shape norms. And this is um, generally we look at the influence of judgments through the lenses of judicial activism and restraint debate and see whether there's certain ideologies behind certain decisions. And I'm what I'm proposing here is that, you know, instead of like seeing the court as an institution to further ideologies, can we just think about, you know, what does this judgment do? Does it clarify things? Does it, does it show its limits? Does it just apply the norm? So this is the, uh, the other part. And finally, the empirical part is about how the European court actually shaped the norm against torture and which judicial characters it invoked. So I look at the two different periods, the one before 1998 and after 1998, when the court became um, a permanent institution with compulsory jurisdiction. And I see kind of different patterns there. What we see is that more entrepreneurial de decisions in the previous periods and more arbitrator decisions in the most current period, this actually goes against the criticism that the court is becoming more, more activist. At least under this article, what I see is that court is actually um, more and more, relatively, this is our relative terms, more and more applying um, law narrowly, actually. Yeah, and it's, so it's interesting. You come up, I think, with two hypotheses about why that may be the case. And one of them is look, the court is busier. And when you're busier, you have far less time to write elaborate judgments setting out and pushing the norm or the, the law, the right in a further. Instead, you just do more bread and butter cases and that's your arbitrator court. Um, and I think the second explanation that you have is, well, by that time, the norm was pretty fleshed out. There was not so much more fleshing out that, to be done. I wonder... Have you studied empirically or through interviews or, or do you have a gut feeling and perhaps that's research that's still to be done about which of these two is the, the stronger explanation or the more plausible one? Um, I guess maybe the second one, like that, my gut feeling and that comes from kind of my comparison with the Inter-American Court. So I didn't write this article in a comparative way, but I had chance to kind of compare these two courts. Uh, based on my interviews that I carried out there, I got the feeling Sorry, that there is in the, the Inter-American Court, okay, actually, yeah. based on the f feeling that I, yeah, in the American Court. What I felt that is that um, for them, every judgment was a chance to clarify things and push out uh, certain ideas because they didn't have a lot of decisions. And uh, so that means that the European Court doesn't have to do that, right? Because you have so many actually decisions to process that you don't have to take a stand on each in each mm -hmm. and every decision. So in a way, yeah, def definitely the, the fact that it already fleshed out principles um, is right now helping the court just write that wave and just apply them. But couldn't you also argue, look, we never know whether it's fleshed out or not. Perhaps we can take the right to be free from torture in ways that we hadn't even imagined. You know, it, it, there's so, still so much fleshing out to do. For sure. I think you can definitely do that too. But then the pragmatism argument kicks in. I think, I mean, it's still up to the court, right? Like if they want to flesh out things, they can. But my feeling is that right now their energy is more on like, let's deal with this backlog and also make sure that we're not getting pushback for all the innovations we are doing. So they want to keep the court as a credible uh, institution. The, the convention is a credible document. So for them, I think it's a pragmatic decision not to push it too much and also like just, you know, apply it right now. Yeah. Okay. Hey, and let's, let's talk a bit about your journal or your, your journey um, with the European Journal of International Law, because as far as I know, and I say this because I've joined the editorial team only quite recently, so I wasn't there at the beginning, but I think you submitted this article two years ago and now it's coming out. Um, Two years later, what would you like to have known 
then at the time you submit it that you know now. And of course, it's very tempting to say, I think, I, I would have liked to know that it would finally be accepted. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but anything else? <laughs> I, so I think two things. So I did, I sort of knew these things that I would take longer because good journals generally take longer and that I will get really good feedback. But I didn't know the extent to which these are going to be the case for me. And I also feel like these are related. So it, the review process was taking so long. It was also because there was really active engagement and um, to improve the work and also like kind of it was overall a kind of formative experience as we as well for me at least and um, I can tell you that I learned three things from this experience one was how to fix this article how to flesh out arguments how to position myself but also um, how to frame articles and present arguments for a legal audience in general so this was definitely there was definitely a forward-looking uh, element to the reviewing process as well and last maybe even more importantly, uh, it showed me a good and constructive way of writing reviews. So um, the first review I received was seven pages long, and it was really detailed. It was critical, but constructive. And uh, what I felt like this anonymous reviewer was really there to help this improve. So I never had a doubt about that. And um, I don't generally feel this way about reviews because generally they are short. Uh, oftentimes they are overly critical, sometimes helpful, but sometimes not necessarily the case. So I felt that there was something different going on. And I took my time to really work through this interview, uh, reviews as well. And, um, and I think what this process showed me was also that there's a different way of doing things. So the day after you accepted my article, you asked me to review an um, article for EGIL, and I gladly accepted it. That's how we work, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Just didn't even have a day off. But, uh, <laughs> but the thing is, I already knew when I accepted that how I would write my review. I would follow the same template, and I would write in a way that I can help this person. And, uh, you know, this is the kind of the collective feeling of improving our work together. And I want to follow this template, um, you know, for the rest of my career, actually. So if I want to summarize my uh, experience at EGIL, I can even uh, offer you an analogy that I thought of, uh, which is like, I think it's more like a fine dining experience that you want to do it when you have time and money and energy. And uh, I definitely understand the appeal of um, going for fast food joints because they're quick and they will solve your, you know, immediate needs. And there is definitely that immediate need as well. Like there's understandably, there's a huge pressure on early career scholars, scholars that are not tenured yet, and they need to get things out fast. But ironically, I think these are the people that would really benefit from such a thorough review process as well. So this is the real dilemma. Well, you may also have been lucky with a particular review I or several, be. I don't know how many reviews there were, but per perhaps you could even compare them. Uh, but there are always some reviews that are yeah better than others. But it, I'm glad that you had a positive experience because indeed it, the review process does add a lot of time. But as you said, it's often also the authors who then rightly take a lot of time to deal with that, the, the comments. And Absolutely. the only thing about the analogy is I think you're, it's so nice that you say uh, the fine dining experience because we often say, well, what we do is, is slow cooking, you know, slow food. Oh, yeah, you know, this that could assuming. also work. The only thing I really hope it's not fine dining in the sense of expensive, because <laughs> I, I hope that the EGL experience is not particularly expensive. But I can imagine that from one perspective, if you're under these pressures to publish quickly, that it may be seen as expensive, because if you don't deliver quickly, then... But actually, that, that brings me back to one final question that I'd like to ask you, um, which is about expensive or at least money uh, the, in the economy. And that goes back to the starting point, which is about this interdisciplinary work. Can you tell us something about the political economy of interdisciplinarity? Because on the one hand, it seems everybody now wants interdisciplinary research. It's so sexy, and that's what the grant uh, awarding bodies ask for. On the other hand, there seem to be some costs um, to it. And I, but I wonder what your experience is before I start, you know, implying uh, my experiences. 
No, um, this is a great question. I'm glad you asked it because uh, that's always been has been at the back of my mind since I started this interdisciplinary journey because we talk a lot about how to do interdisciplinarity and what to do and what not to do. But oftentimes, you know, this, this gets ignored. Like what, what is the real cost and consequences of interdisciplinarity? Because as you rightly pointed out, it's really popular these days and I understand why. I mean, I'm enjoying it myself too. And there's definitely a promotion done by the grant giving agencies as well. If you write into this project, generally it goes through faster. At least that was my experience. And um, so there's definitely increased supply of interdisciplinary research out there. But what I feel as an early career scholar is that there's not necessarily a demand that meets that supply. You know, journals are quite disciplinary. Publishing houses are very disciplinary. I mean, of course, there are uh, exceptions, but especially departments are very disciplinary still. Mm -hmm. So there's this hype and we all want to do this and, you know, we encourage people to go and, you know, learn different things and apply it. But on the other hand, are we really thinking, you know, how to place them, where to place them as well? I mean, this, I think, should be part of the discussion as well. Um, as you said, the political economy of dis interdisciplinarity. And do you think that the departments are so disciplinary because of the teaching needs, that teaching is still very disciplinary? Or is there also something about research that they, they still try to pe put people in certain boxes? I mean, it could be both as well. I think the teaching needs are overall disciplinary. I mean, I can understand if you want to hire a someone in your department, you want someone to teach, I don't know, public international law, general principles and whatnot, and someone interdisciplinary cannot have that kind of comment, although they can as well. I mean, it depends on the person, obviously. But um, so it can be about the needs. But it's also, um, you know, most of the time we are still very siloed because this is the comfort zone. And, you know, why would you leave? Because interdisciplinary work requires you to leave your comfort zone to do this, but also requires your readers to leave their, their comfort zone as well. It's just uncomfortable for everyone. Um, so in a way, I can understand the appeal for just not doing it and doing whatever you know the best as well. So, well, I can tell our EGIL live watchers and EGIL readers that I think you're extremely good in taking the readers by the hand. Um, I don't think they feel uncomfortable at all when they read your article because it's so clearly written. And um, well, you may say that's in part thanks to the reviewer, I don't know, but it, it's extremely clear and you will take them by the hand into a very, very interesting journey. So I recommend Thank reading you. your article to everybody. Look out for our volume 31, issue one. Eski, thanks a lot for this interview. And I really, um, I hope that, uh, well, th th wish you all the best with the, the career path that you've set out. And many of us will follow you with great interest. Thank you so much. Can I do something unusual and um, ask you if I can thank this anonymous reviewer because we've been talking oh, yeah, about okay. this person. And uh, Go because ahead, of the, the floor is yeah, yours. <laughs> now the last <laughs> final final word. Because of the journal's policy, I couldn't really add this in the acknowledgement section, but I really am um, truly grateful for all the supportive feedback that this person provided. So I'm happy to say this in person as well. Thank you. Good. I wish we can do this with all authors. <laughs>